I'm going to just jump right in, and if you brought your Bible, we're just going to read one scripture to start with. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 35. And tonight's message, or this evening's message for us, is titled, The Blasphemy, the Blasphemy Law, Friend or Foe. And we're going to take a little bit closer look at the law, the bill that we have now made a law in our land. And so, Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 35. And it says, yet you, yet you keep saying, I am innocent. Surely his anger has turned away from me. Behold, I will bring you to judgment and will plead against you because you say, I have not sinned. Amen. You know, it surely is interesting times where you're living in. Would you not agree? Yeah. And as we're aware, on October 26, 2018, we the people in Ireland voted to remove Article 40.6.1.I of the 37th Amendment, which was to remove the blasphemy law from our Constitution. So tonight, because I've had some people reach out wanting to understand, um, they've reached out wanting to have a better understanding for what I would say has become a confusing issue for many believers, this blasphemy law. Within the, in the body of Christ is what I'm speaking primarily to tonight, not unsaved people. But we've made a stand as a ministry where we should be as believers, and because of that, some have reached out just wanting to understand what they thought potentially could be a good thing to remove this law from our land, from our Constitution. So... First, let me start by saying the apostasy in the church at large is increasing rapidly. And apostasy is defined as falling away from biblical principles. What's also important to tie in with that is what is in the leadership permeates down to the body. So whether they realize it or not, that's just a spiritual law. Um, and that is the main reason this referendum ever gained momentum and became a bill and sadly became our law because the leadership embraced biblical principles. Well, let me say that because leadership in the church, first and foremost, is not in, have fallen away from biblical principles. Let me rephrase it that way. That helps to make, make sense. And so it is what we have done is now, how do we say it? It's now become a law. We basically made a law to remove a part of our Constitution. And what we have just voted for is something that we, don't, we do not want as a Christian. This new law that has removed an old law, it is a law that opposes God, what we voted for. It is a law of lawlessness, this referendum that we voted. And so we can define lawlessness simply as laws that are void of God. So we can see by removing the blasphemy law, it was directly about God and profaning his authority. We can see it by removing it, our Constitution has become more void of God. And so most Christians believe there's a gray in God's kingdom. And I would, I would say that's a deception that does not align with his word. God's kingdom is 
either black or white. We are either on the side of good or we're on the side of evil. Anything else is called compromise, which is sadly what most in the church walk in due to all the doctrines of demons we've embraced that have watered down this holy word. We've at large have lost the fear of the Lord. At large, not everybody. I always have to qualify that and say that. So let me ask a question. How, could, how can we consider, as a Christian, to want to vote to remove the Lord's name for our land? How could we even consider that? On the, what may seem an ancient or irrelevant law that I, or a part of our Constitution that I've heard. So how could we, how could we even consider, as a believer, to want to vote to remove the Lord's name? How irreverent, mockful, and foolish would that seem to our great king? I would have to ask that question. And I, and I, I believe we've done so because of the lukewarm spirit that is prevalent in the body of Christ. And it's like a, a deadly virus that's plaguing his body. With the doctrines of demons, it tells us we can do anything we wish, and it will still work out okay for us. How often... When, when we're walking in that place, which is called compromise, do we hear God's in control of everything, right? Yeah. Therefore, he'll make it all right in the end. Okay? So, that false belief, and not that, God, that, not that it's a false belief that God's in control of everything, because he is in control of everything, and I'll talk about that mm -hmm. a, little, a little bit as we go on, but that false belief that says we can do whatever we want and everything's going to work out in the end, that false belief goes against what his word teaches us. In Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 8 through 6 says, our carnal mind, our flesh, is death to us. And, if, and that if we walk after our flesh, it very strong words. It says we are his enemy. And it even goes on to further say, in verse 8, it says, therefore we're not pleasing to him. So, if we're walking after our, our carnal ways of doing things in the flesh and not walking after the spirit, his word tells us that it's death to us. That we are an enemy to God. And that we are not pleasing to him. That's a strong warning that very few pay any attention to. That God sees us as his enemy when we do not walk after his commandments. And when we're not willing to exchange our will for his will. And remember, I'm speaking primarily to Christians not the unsaved. That's a whole other story. But when he died on the cross, when he paid the price for us to be a part of God's family, he paid a price for us that we could never pay. He paid a debt that we could never, that he didn't owe. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 says, he bought us, he now owns us. So we don't have a right to just go out and do whatever we want anymore. We can. But if it doesn't align with the will of God, it's called rebellion and disobedience. And some people, whether they know it or not, it doesn't change the fact that it's still rebellion or disobedience. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if we had the fear of the Lord, and I mean this at large because I know there's a company of people here and I'm not speaking, I'm speaking at large. I just want to be very clear about that. There's a remnant here. But if we had fear of the Lord on us at large in his body, we would not even consider thinking it is okay to remove God from our laws, no matter how archaic we might think that might be. And many pastors and leaders 
and churches here in Ireland voted to remove this law. This is what happens. First in the church, we then see what happens in the government. What happens in our government is a direct reflection of what is taking place in the church. A direct mirror of that. And I'm going to read, just to tie into that, and, and this is something that pulled at my heart greatly, just grievously, and I wasn't looking for it, and it was an email that I had gotten, but just to put that, that last statement in place, that many pastors, leaders, and churches in this nation voted to remove this, this law. I had received, and this is a public, what's the right word, Lord, help me with this, because I want to be very um, gracious and um, it's a public statement that this person made, who I would say is influential in the body of Christ in our nation. So what I'm sharing isn't anything private. It's not gossip. It's not slander. I'm not here to tear someone down. I'm not even mentioning the person's name. But it's been put out there for all all to see because they were asked to share their view on the referendum. So they did. And when I read it, I was absolutely appalled. I was absolutely appalled that someone that's a Christian was taking such a strong stand that I would consider very anti-God. And parts of what they wrote in their public letter encouraging people to vote yes on the referendum. Huge sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said, in the leadership permeates down to the body. And so um, some of what they had shared in their letter, they said, I'm acutely aware that the existence of Ireland's blasphemy law is used by other countries that have draconian blasphemy laws as justification for their laws. The best known example of this is Pakistan, where Asia Bibi, a Christian farm worker, accused of blasphemy, has languished in prison for over nine years. And she was currently waiting um, for her to, for the appeal to go forth against her. She had a death sentence against her, and I know there's been breakthroughs in that, and she's supposed to be freed, and there's still some hold up there. But at this time when they wrote this, it was on October 26th that I received this email. And so they further went on to say, Ireland's blasphemy law is irrelevant. They then posed the question, why keep it in the Constitution? The God who made heaven and earth doesn't need a blasphemy law to protect him. Well, I would strongly disagree with what was put forth, and I did, and therefore I got asked questions, and I believe this is on the Lord's heart that sometimes we need to talk about these things, and I don't believe in separation of church and state. The church is to be the government, the righteous government, that we're supposed to be the ones ruling and reigning on this earth. So. Some people think you shouldn't mix, quote, politics, and I think it's just biblically correct that we have to talk about these things because they're happening in the body of Christ. Yes. And part of it is, is, as I said, this blasphemy law, from what I can hear from others, it seems to have become this very confusing issue. In my mind, would be black and white. Mm -hmm. it, so have to look at that. And why has it become confusing? Why... Why would we even consider voting on this to remove it from our Constitution? So there was just one example of a Christian leader posing their opinion, their view. And I would say it's not based on the Bible, but it was based on experiences and maybe 
you know, just out of not really understanding what God teaches. I, I don't want to judge the heart. I don't know the heart. Um, but from what I read in their letter, I would say it was a letter that was in error. And so, but also had influence in the body of Christ. Yeah. And so, um, as his body, as his believers, Yeshua expects us to enforce the victory of the cross. He, he paid the price. He died. Everything was accomplished. It was a finished work when he died and was resurrected from the dead. But we, as being partakers in his kingdom, he expects us to enforce that victory. And so I would ask the question, so what are we saying to the Lord by removing this law from our land? So what are we saying? And, and before I do, I want to say, that not only does the Lord expect us to enforce the victory of the cross, and I talked earlier, a bit, just a few minutes ago, that God's in control of everything. And that's a truthful statement. Everything comes from him and everything returns back to him. That's what his word tells us. But he can only be in control, not only in our personal lives, but in our nation to the degree we allow him to be. Because he's a respecter of our will. We have a free will. And he'll never go against our free will. So God is in control, but in our personal lives and in, in, on a governmental level in nations, to the degree that we'll allow him to be in control. And this isn't tonight's teaching or message, but there's consequences and, and why we intercede. And if we keep choosing to rebel, that cup of wrath is filling up. And then he has to bring his judgments against us. We started out with Jeremiah 2.35. And he said, Behold, therefore I will bring my judgments, because you keep saying, I am innocent. I have not sinned. So, um, so what are we saying? So what could we be possibly saying by removing this law from our land, from our, our constitution now, um, the blasphemy law? We're saying basically to the Lord, we don't want you, Lord. We don't want you, Lord Jesus, as our king over our nation anymore. Get out. We don't need you. The church at large believes we can do anything we like, and it will work out in the end. But the truth and reality is there are consequences to our choices that do not align with the written word of God. It will not always end well for those who choose to rebel against the Lord and not obey his word. We see that with Queen Vashti in the book of Esther, who depicts the lukewarm church. She had no fear of her king. She rebelled against him. Therefore, we saw she was removed from the kingdom. We as a nation, and sadly, his church have chosen to rebel openly for the whole world to see by voting in this bill, saying, we don't want to walk in the fear of the Lord. We have mocked our great king, saying we will be our own kings. We will walk in fear of man, and we, and we will not walk in fear of you, Lord. It's important to understand we have we have done so on a govern a governmental level now because we did we have done it first in the church. We have removed Jesus at large in his own church. At large. He's got his remnant. We have lost the fear of the Lord, holiness, purity, and we have lost a desperate hunger for truth. Ireland's constitution was written acknowledging the one and true living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty. This blasphemy law that we had, that we no longer have, but the, this blasphemy law that we had, first and foremost declared to our Lord and Savior that we have fear for his holy name. 
Second, it was a declaration over us as a people, tribe, tongue, and nation that we will walk in the fear of the Lord or face consequences. A very biblical foundation it was founded on. Thirdly, it declared to the world, we are a nation that will walk in the fear of the Lord. You know, James 4.4 4 warns us that says that if we're the world's friends, if we become the world's friend, we're an enemy to God. So our Constitution was not written acknowledging or bowing down to the false demon God called Allah that the Muslim nations worship, nor was it written to their false prophet Muhammad. It is a plot of the enemy to get believers to try to compare their false God to our one and true living God regarding our blasphemy law by using the persecutions that have taken place in those Muslim nations because people refuse to bow to Muhammad or Allah, like Ashi Bibi. This plot is to put fear of man into our put the put fear of man into our minds by saying this law could be used against us. I've actually had people write me and say that. We thought that this could actually, this law be used against us because Islam will come and then somehow, somehow it'll get twisted and used against us. Very deceptive. We, Ireland, was founded on Jesus Christ, our constitution. We were not founded on Muhammad and Allah. And so big difference. So, but when the, but instead of this law being used against us as it existed, it no longer exists, but when the reality is now that we have removed it, we've removed God's covering, so to speak, because we've removed the fear of the Lord from our lives. This was the first step that had to be taken in order to remove all mentions of the Lord God Almighty from our Constitution, There's, uh, th which he is mentioned in our preamble. But this was the very first step that had to be taken, which is the agenda of the elite, the Illuminati, and the EU. If they succeed, then those very fears of our brothers and sisters who think this law was going to be used against us will come to true, but if they succeed in accomplishing their agenda to remove our land, our government, from all mentions of the Lord God Almighty, that will open us up to Sharia law, as we are seeing being enforced in some EU nations and in some migrant Muslim communities, specifically Greece, France, Germany, and they have, I believe Greece has two laws, Sharia law and the law of the people, because of the, the numbers of migrants and Muslims that have populated. So now they get to choose, do I want to go be under the, the Sharia law ju jurisdiction or the laws of whatever that nation is that they're in? It's happening. And so by comparing our blasphemy law to other nations who do not serve the one and true living God, who use their blasphemy laws to perse persecute people for not bowing down to those demon gods is a distorted twist on truth and an evil scheme of the enemy to keep his sleeping church in a slumber by calling what was good now evil. A day is coming very soon when those in the church who refuse to come out of compromise, mm -hmm. out of Babylon, will realize they have been deceived. But it will be too late. Just like the five foolish versions, it was too late for them that Matthew speaks about in 25.10. The five that were prepared, they went in to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The five foolish who were not prepared, they went out to go fill their oils. They came and they knocked on the door. Lord, Lord, open. He said, depart from me. I know you not. It was too late. I'd say they didn't have fear of the Lord on them either, or they would have prepared their oil lamps. You know, 
It's why intercession is needed in this hour more than ever in all of Ireland's history, and especially for his true church to rise and be strengthened in this hour like never before. We are in the war of wars, and it will be one with those who are willing to bend their hearts and knees in a lifestyle prayer and intercession. Those who will not love their own life unto death, the consequences of moving this law are just one of many serious issues we are going to have to contend with going forward. The day is rapidly getting darker, as a lot of us are aware of. A lot of us are aware, and there are people praying, thank God. But this vote to, rem to remove this law was a sign of the times for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. It's what Matthew in Matthew 16, 3, that Yeshua rebuked the Pharisees for. You know how to interpret the signs in the skies, but you do not know how to interpret the signs of the, the signs of the, the the signs of the times. I'll say that again. This vote to remove this law was a sign of the times for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. The Lord is looking to his true church to stand against the evil that affronts us. He's looking for us to stand for truth no matter what the cost. He's looking for unity. He's not looking for unity at the cost of our souls being destroyed by walking in compromise and doing things the world's ways. He's looking for unity and truth. That's what he spoke to me a couple years ago when I was seeking about this false unity movement that's on the fast track now in the nations, saying we need to accept each other's diversities in the body of Christ. Not just other religions, which it's also based on, the Chrislam, but that we need to accept each other's diversities within the body of Christ. You know, the Lord said, unity and truth. Unity and truth will cause the separation to take place as most in the church don't really want truth. That's just the sad reality. I believe that day will change when the numbers will increase. But currently, it's very few. They want, they want to do whatever seems good in their own eyes. Most are not willing to surrender their will for his to take up their cross and follow him wherever he, wherever he may lead. Every decision we make, I so often encourage others, it doesn't matter what the decision is whether we're voting on a law, which I think is a very serious thing that we just voted on, that I don't think most realize how serious this is before the Lord. But every decision we make has to be based on what the Word of God teaches us, not what seems right in our own eyes, and not what the popular opinion is saying to us in the hour that we live. The Word of God says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom that we are to have no other gods above them, that his people perish from lack of knowledge. You know, Isaiah 5.13 says that my people went into captivity because they had no knowledge of me. Knowledge, you often hear me define as familiarity gained by personal experience. When we have a personal encounter with the one and true living God, our wills come into alignment with his or we reject it. One of the two but we know who he is and what he's after and what he's, what he, who he is as a, as, a, as a person of the Lord Jesus and his standards for us. So the Lord is grieved with us, his people, who are to be called by his name, who voted to remove the fear of the Lord from our land, because that's really what we did. That law at least said, as I said, three things it declared and renowned, that we as a nation had fear of the Lord, as a people, as a tribe, as a tongue. The Lord is grieved, and, and as you know, and those that get to know me, I'm fervently passionate about the Lord being crowned king in our, in our land as he deserves, and starting with his church, not just here, but everywhere every nation. He deserves nothing less. The call in my life is to help prepare his bride for the dark days that are getting darker, to sound the alarm how unprepared we are for his soon second coming, 
with a call back to repentance, holiness, purity, and to the fear of the Lord in an intimate love relationship and not in the do list of religion. He's looking for relationship with us. He's looking to restore us back to that place. I realize most do not want to hear how late the hour is, nor do they want to conform to his high and holy standards. At the same time, we as a ministry here, we know his remnant are here, praise the Lord. We've been blessed to meet many, many precious brothers and sisters who do want the meet, who are teachable, who will receive correction, who want to, who want to purify themselves to his standards, who are taking up their cross and following the Lamb wherever, wherever he may, may lead. Praise the Lord. It is what encourages us to go on. The sad reality is, is though most, as I said, most I said earlier, they don't really want truth. And I think we could, we've probably all encountered this in our own lives. And I think as we even, I'm speaking at large, and I, I know that there's a process in that. But if we really want truth, we become teachable. If we really want truth, we let go of our old ways of doing things, our our belief systems that we thought was the truth, but doesn't really align with the Word of God. We really look at the Word of God and let Holy Spirit start working in our hearts. But most don't really want it because when truth comes, it's usually not what we think it's going to be. When it comes, it's usually painful because it's exposing a lie that we believed about ourselves, our family, our lives, situations, people, whatever it might be, circumstances. So it can be painful at times. And especially if we've walked in a place of complacency, if we've walked in a place of lukewarmness, it can really rub our flesh the wrong way. And so that's why I say most don't really want truth. We say we do, but when it but when it comes and it doesn't tickle our ears, we reject it. And the source of that truth now becomes the problem, not our hard heart or the false belief systems that we had embraced. Equally, I've been very blessed to encounter firsthand with our great King, His high and holy standards. So my passion on what I share is not only based on the Word of God, but what I've been privileged to see here with my spiritual ears and my eyes wide open. And not just for me, but to help those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. It's a call I cannot do in my own strength. It's all by grace. Knowing, just like you, I'm perfectly flawed. And I'm choosing every day, every breath, every step of my life to be perfected in His love. His love. In his way. My heart is grieved over the latest vote that took place in our nation. Our Lord's heart is grieved beyond description. I feel that burden. I carry that burden with the Lord every day, every breath. And not just over these issues, but there's many, many other issues. And I know many of us are on board with the other issues that we've been seeing take place. You know, same-sex marriage, the LGBT agenda that's come in, the, the abortion that we've legalized here, the murdering of our, our, our children. But my heart is grieved over all. But, so when I see something like this, it's just more grievous. And so, but... If it more important, it's our Lord's heart is grieved beyond description that I couldn't put in human words. But I feel his burden and his grief that he has over the choices that we are making that are not strengthening us as his body, that are not causing us to go the right way, to stay on a narrow path with him, but instead we are getting we're on the broad road of destruction at large, not everybody. And he has a true church that will rise up. But I carry that burden with the Lord every day, every breath. You know, as a ministry, we've labored here three plus years 
with tears and intercession, first of his bride, here would be birth, and she was on September 20th in 2017, <clears throat> but equally that she will mature into bridal love, that his true church will arise and build the broken down walls starting in the church our nation can be saved. And they'll say that, you know, prior to the three plus years that we've been, been laboring, many years, I've been sowing years into this land in tears of prayer and intercession before my return here in 2015. So when I share these things, they can sound hard to some. I don't speak lightly about them, but I speak with the fear of the Lord upon me. The hour is very late. When I see things like I've seen taking place in our land, most have no idea how heartbreaking it is to my heart and soul, but ultimately to our Father in Heaven. He lets me feel that on a level that keeps me broken before Him, to keep interceding on behalf of the one He died for so that we would inherit the fullness of our inheritance in Him. You know, brokenness is a good place to be in the Lord. When it, you're broken for what his heart breaks for. It's a really, not only a safe place to be at, but brokenness emits a fragrance to the Lord that is beautiful. And that fragrance is a key ingredient to the golden altar of incense filling up that we often pray for to happen. But brokenness is a good place to be. That's a whole nother teaching um, that I do believe will come forth just on the beauty of brokenness, on the fragrance that that brokenness admits that we can't see, we don't feel it, our lives are falling apart, everything's painful, it, it just, but when we're, we're going through, through it His way, when we feel His burden, when we feel how He feels about our sin or how He feels about Someone else, you know, not someone else is in, not out of a judgment, but out of compassion. Because no, the Lord isn't looking to destroy us. When I say He's grieved, He isn't looking to destroy us. He's weeping over us because He knows the choices we are making are not for our good. He out of, He wants to see us be restored, not destroyed. We'll get to decide that by the choices we make individually in our lives, as a people, and as nation. And so. The vote that took place is the exact opposite of what we pray for as a ministry, what we're fighting for. It's the exact opposite. We're looking for righteousness to be restored in our land, not ripped out of it. Righteousness and justice to be restored back into our government, not just flippantly removed. So it's very grievous to see that happen. But at the same time, I'm very aware that this, very aware that this is the hour we are in, and the apost the apostasy will only increase in this church. It's time for the wheat and the tares to separate, starting within the church, separating the profane from the holy. You often hear me say it's going to be ugly and it's going to be messy. It's going to be painful. For those who are willing to speak the truth, standing against the evil, all the compromise, that number will be few initially initially. But please know those few will be called the problem. They'll be the ones that will be called the false prophets, the false teachers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that will be called the divisive ones. Mm -hmm. When the opposite will be the truth. And, it, and they will be labeled that way because they will be the few that are arising in this nation that will hold leaders to accountability to what the Word teaches. And if they cannot get fed in their places of fellowship, and we're seeing this too, more house churches are starting to spring up in this land. There's a company of people that are hungry for truth, hungering for righteousness to be restored. And on a, a large level, we've got a pharisaic, pharisaic legal system over the body of Christ 
stopping his flock from going in to the Holy of Holies and for standing up for what is right and, and truthful. And so I'm very keenly aware of the hour we're in and the agenda Satan has against the true church. And one thing I'm not going to talk a lot about, but we need to know one of the active ingredients that is very active in the church in this hour is witchcraft and sorcery. And it is one that is putting spells and curses and mesmerizing and seducing, charming and beguiling the body of, body of Christ at large. And if you've got open doors, if you're in compromise, if you're in sin, you are an easy target to be deceived by specifically the witchcraft. So, equally, souls are at stake because of positions that are being taken in the church that are anti-God positions. And I would say, encouraging the flaw to vote yes, to remove the blasphemy law, is what I would say is an anti-God position. And it's putting souls at stake. So many are vulnerable. So many are not mature enough to discern what is right or wrong. So they read something and they're influenced. That's terrifying to me. Be ter it's terrifying to me as a leader, as a teacher of the Word of God, that ultimately that person will be held accountable for putting a trap and snare for someone who will fall away because they influenced that. We'll all have to stand for our own sin, but there's accountabilities for that. And so as well as our nation is standing on a very dangerous precipice. We're standing in the balance scales before the Lord God Almighty right now. His eyes are on us seeing what we're doing. The balance scales, well, where are they going to fall? Because we chose to move, remove God, I would say because we chose to remove the fear of the Lord, because we still have mentions of the Lord in our Constitution. But this blasphemy law, as I said, was clearly a law that said we had fear of the Lord. That, that if we disobeyed this law, it meant we would pay consequences. Never has been reinforced in this nation. No one has ever been prosecuted or sent to prison. But there was a spiritual law in place. And it spoke volumes to the Lord as a Christian nation that our Constitution was written under. And so, because we chose to remove God, the fear of the Lord, from our Constitution, it will not be good for Ireland. It will not be for our good. We will have a serious price to pay for it, we can be assured on top of all our other lawless laws that we've been voting in over the last few years that I named a few to mention. You know, Ecclesiastes 8.12 says, the latter part of that scripture says, it will be well for those who fear the Lord. So we know it will not be well for those who do not fear the Lord. The Lord is looking to his church, his ecclesia, and ecclesia is what the Greek is for church in the in the test in the New Testament or Renewed Testament is probably more accurate um, interpretation of the the New Testament. But church is ecclesia, and ecclesia means a ruling govern gov a ruling govern government of a, a, a body, a body that is governing. It isn't a building. It isn't a membership. It isn't a, dom a denomination. It's a ruling group of people, a, a, a group of people who are ruling over their cities, over their communities, first starting in their own households, in their mm -hmm. marriages, in their children's lives, over their families, but in righteousness. So Ecclesia is a body of people who are who are called to govern this land in righteousness. And so 
The Lord is going to hold us accountable for the evil that we have allowed into the church and into our government. It's time for the true church to rise, to come out of Babylon and quit making excuses for our compromise. That may seem like a very strong word to say, but the topic at hand is literally life and death to us. You know, Ezekiel 9, 4 says, um, I might even just turn there and read that real quick. Ezekiel 9, 4 says, And then the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in the midst of it. And to the others he said, in my hearing, Follow the man with the ink bottle through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have any pity. Slay outright the elderly, the young man, and the virgin, the infant, and the woman. But do not touch or go near anyone on whom is the mark. And he says, begin at my sanctuary. You know, that was Ezekiel having a vision. I believe Ezekiel. I believe, I believe Ezekiel seeing into our day. And that angel was sent out with an ink bottle to go mark the foreheads of those who were sighing and groaning over the sins in their nation. And everyone who wasn't, there were the others that had their battle axe in hand and they were told to slay them. There's consequences. And so, and it also said, start in the sanctuary. When we, his people, voted to remove this law, we did what Jeremiah spoke. We we did what Jeremiah spoke about in chapter two, verses two through through five. Jeremiah said, spoke in those verses. He said that Israel was called to holiness, and went after emptiness, falseness, and futility. Therefore, became fruitless and worthless. And. Just like the Israel is called to holiness, the church is called to holiness. And because we haven't chosen to walk in the holiness of the Lord, we are full of emptiness, falseness, and futility, therefore become becoming worthless and fruitless to the Lord. That's the amplified yeah. translation. You know, the day after the vote, as you've heard me already mention, I was really very grieved, and I was just sitting before the Lord, grieved and praying and asking, where do we go from here, Lord? How do we move forward now? What are you saying? And I want to turn to Jeremiah 2. We haven't really left it, but he gave me Jeremiah 2. Verse, chapter 2, verses 11 through 19, to let me know what he had to say about it and where we stand as the people, tribe, tongue, and nation before him. And I'd like to read those verses if that's okay. So in chapter 2, starting in verse 11, it says, Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished and appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked and shriveled up with horror, says the Lord, at the behavior of the people. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, which cannot hold water. Is Israel a serpent? Is he a home-born slain? Why has he become captive and prey? The young lions have roared over him and made their voices heard, and they have made his land a waste. His cities are burned, ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the children of Memphis and Tephnus, Egypt, have in times past shown their power as a foe. They have broken and fed on the crown of your head, Israel, so do not rely on them as an alley now. Have you not 
brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now that and now what have you to gain by allying yourself with Egypt and going her way to drink the black and royaled waters of the Nile? Or what have you to gain in going the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your own wickedness shall chasten and corrupt you, and your backslidings and desertion of faith shall reprove you. Know, therefore, and recognize that this is an evil and bitter thing. First, you have forsaken the Lord your God. Second, you are indifferent to me, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. So, I pray that what I've shared this evening, one, as you know, whatever we talk about here is always to help prepare us for prayer, because we do need to pray. But I pray that what I've shared will only help answer what has, I would say, is has become not an uncomplicated question regarding the blasphemy law and why Christians and the confusion around it. There, so many have voted and think it's a good thing to remove it. So I hope that this at least answers some of those questions. I hope it puts it in a different light. I hope it enlightens the eyes of the understandings of some who just really didn't know, but now they, I hope, have a better understanding. Yeah. Um, and it's, it seriously is, it's a time to pray like never before, like our lives depend upon it, because they really do. And it's why identification, repentance, and intercession is needed in all 32 counties, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is what we are laboring fervently and passionately for to see come forth. And I know many others are, and there's a lot of, a lot of good things happening here in that remnant. And, and it's also hope in this, even though we've done this as a nation, and yes, the Lord is looking to his church, and we're speaking to the church, us tonight, not to the unsaved people. But there's hope in that, too. You know, there's, it will always be a praying remnant that brings in the nations. It's not going to be the masses, but it'll be the praying remnant. And so on that note, let's pray.